Good evening. I'm uh, Dick Meserve. I am the president of the Carnegie Institution, and I'd like to welcome you all to a capital science lecture. Uh, this evening's lecture is being co-hosted by the Carnegie Institution, the embassies of Switzerland and Italy, and the Balzan Foundation. Uh, our speaker tonight was the recipient of a very prestigious medal from the Balzan Foundation. And I would be very, very pleased to introduce a few of our partners for this evening. First, uh, Ms. Suzanne Weber is the Secretary General of the International Balzan Foundation. Could I ask you to stand and say hello? And we're also joined by Dr. Christoph Ebel, who is the Counselor for Science and Technology at the Embassy of Switzerland. And Christoph, let me invite you to come to the podium and say a few words. And then I will introduce tonight's speaker. Sounds like a plan. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dick, for the introduction. And um, uh, let me also uh, very warmly welcome you here to the um, to this uh, lecture tonight. Um, I have uh, the uh, I'm on a mission here, uh, so to speak. Uh, and the ambassador of Switzerland has uh, Manuel Zagor has tasked me with. Um, uh, sending his uh, special greetings to uh, to you tonight. Um, he unfortunately couldn't make it tonight. Uh, ambassadors tend to be pretty busy, um, but he uh, he has uh, had uh, the pleasure of um, meeting with um, uh, Dr. Silk and a few uh, colleagues yesterday night for dinner. And um, uh, he told me this morning that he enjoyed that very much. And he uh, he's a lawyer, but. Um, he said he uh, he definitely enjoyed uh, having some uh, some scientific input, which of course is a good thing for me because uh, he understands that there is uh, there is that uh, out there as well. So um, tonight, of course, we have uh, we we're enjoying the the Balzan lecture, and um, uh, as Dick Meserv already uh, said, this is a, a um, it's an enterprise uh, that we we share with our Italian colleagues. Um, and, and also the Balzan Foundation. And uh, it, is, um, it is my pleasure also to, to give thanks today um, to, to my colleagues from the Italian Embassy. Um, I wanna also, just for those of you who have um, been at the Balzan Lecture in, in previous years, I just wanna give a little um, a note to my, to my uh, colleague, uh, Alberto, um, who used to be my, my colleague, he's back now in, in Italy uh, teaching in Sardinia. And uh, this this lecture was very very close to his heart. I just wanted to uh, to say that those of you who know him uh, know what I mean. Uh, but also, I would like to to thank uh, tonight um, Suzanne Werder, also from the, uh, the Secretary General of the of the Balzan Foundation, for uh, supporting this, and especially also the Carnegie Institution uh, for for once again hosting hosting this tonight. Um, I know it's not easy to fit. Uh, the programming and get everything uh, everything um, uh, lined up uh, as as we do, t and and this is it means a lot to us. So so thanks a lot for that, uh, Dick. Also Susan, Garvey, and uh, special thanks to Ben Ben. Where are you, Ben Barben, who is uh, who is making all of this possible. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, the, tonight's lecture. I, I'm not going to um, introduce uh, Joe Sig. This is the, the, the privilege of, of uh, Dr. Reserve. But um, just looking at the, the book titles um, uh, of uh, Joe Sig's books: uh, Cosmic Enigmas, The Big Bang, On the Shores of the Unknown, and most recently, The Left Hand of Creation. Uh, I think even uh, those of us who are not necessarily familiar with the, with the science behind it. I think we are we are definitely in for a very exciting and interesting and engaging evening. So uh, thanks once more uh, for being here. It's great to see a full house, and um, I would like to uh, I would like you to sit back and uh, go on that journey uh, with us. And um, happy to share that with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. This is the uh, first capital science lecture of the 2012-13 season, and what better place to start than with a lecture about the universe? One of the fascinating aspects of astronomy is that a study of the skies 
enables us to peer back in time. This is the consequence of the fact that light travels at a finite speed, and given the almost incomprehensible spatial dimensions of the universe, our examination of the heavens, in fact, enables the study of the deep past. There was considerable debate about the nature and the speed of light among the ancients. Most believed until the 1600s that light traveled at infinite speed. Galileo was one of the first to attempt to quantify the speed of light. He designed an experiment using two covered lanterns with shutters, which assistants opened at specified times. It was one of Galileo's most unsuccessful experiments. Uh, yielded no information beyond the fact that light traveled very, very fast. The first uh, estimation of the speed of light with that actually came up with a number occurred a half a century later when a Danish astronomer, Olaf Rumer, studying the apparent motion of Jupiter's moon Io provided evidence that light traveled at about 220,000 kilometers per second. This was about three quarters of the correct value. We now know that all light waves, whether they travel as visible light, microwaves, infrared waves, or any other wavelength, move at slightly less than 300,000 kilometers per second in a vacuum. The oldest detectable light is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, which was discovered in the mid-1960s. This light, which permeates the universe, is a relic of the universe's birth and arises from the conflagration of radiation and elementary particles in the aftermath, or at the time, of the Big Bang. Support for the existence of the Big Bang arose from the discovery by Carnegie astronomer Edwin Hubble that the universe was expanding. I always need to add a little Carnegie <laughs> angle to these. Uh, but the discovery of the cosmic microwave background provided further evidence. Our guest tonight, Dr. Joseph Silk, began studying the cosmic microwave background shortly after it was discovered. He was especially intrigued by the fluctuations of photons and matter in the very early universe. In the late 1960s, he developed a mathematical expression for the diffusion damping of photons, which had the effect of smoothing out matter density heterogeneities, heterogeneities in the early universe. These density fluctuations provided the seeds for the growth of stars and galaxies. This damping effect today bears Silk's name and was cited by the Balzan Committee, which honored him last year as being, and I'm quoting, a decisive contribution that helped transform cosmology into a high precision science. Dr. Silk is a world-renowned expert in theoretical cosmology, and over his distinguished career, he has made many other pioneering advances. These include novel approaches to understanding and detecting dark matter, and key work on structural feedback mechanisms that are central to our current understanding of galaxy formation. He is a truly international scientist. He is a professor at the Institut d'Astrophique in the Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris, as well as Homeward Professor of Physics at the Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He is also a senior fellow at the University of Oxford, where from 1999 until 2011, he served as civilian professor of astronomy, and where in 2004, he established the Beecroft Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. He was born in the United Kingdom. He studied mathematics at the University of Cambridge and earned his PhD in 1968 at Harvard. His first teaching post was at the University of California at Berkeley, where he became chair of astronomy in 1978. He remained at Berkeley for 30 years before returning to the UK in 1999. Dr. Silk is the author of more than 600 papers, as well as many popular articles and books. And Christoph mentioned uh, some of the titles. He is a fellow of the Institute of Physics, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Physical Society. He is an honorary member of the French Physical Society, a fellow of the Royal Society, 
and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2008, he received the Royal Astronomical Society Gold Medal. And last year, as we mentioned, he was honored with an international Balzan Prize. It is through the generosity of the Balzan Foundation that we welcome here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joseph Silk. So it's a really great pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for that glowing introduction. Is the sound on? Okay. Great, so I'm going to take you on somewhat of an adventure tonight, um, um, from the beginning of univer the universe to uh, uh, what may well be its end. Um, but it's interesting to, to, to realize that many of the ideas that are now very effectively clothed with modern science, go back a very long time. And this is one of my favorite quotes, for example, um, from Blaise Pascal. Um, Nature is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Now this is a remarkably precise description of Einstein's view of how the universe had to be and the developments that have led to our present understanding of cosmology, of the Big Bang. And so you can see these ideas that we should not be in any preferred place. Um, there need be no boundary as, you know, we're not living on a flat earth. We don't worry about falling off the edge. The same seems to be true, we believe, for the universe. So what I thought I would do is take you on a historical tour of um, how our knowledge developed. And maybe it's fitting to begin with um, the scientist that Dick mentioned, a, a Carnegie member at the time, um, Edwin Hubble. And I'm going to tell you a story that is not widely known, actually. Um, and it's probably the first story in the 20th century of cosmic censorship. Um, it's been called that. And so Hubble, in 1929, um, put together a lot of observations, some which he carried out, some from others, um, and realized that as galaxies were further away, this is distance plotted this way, their apparent speed, as measured by the Doppler shift, the shift of light, the red, from the spectrum, increased. Um, and from this, you did, he deduced that the universe... Um, most likely was expanding. Now, Hubble himself never really got to grips with the nature of what expansion meant, but this is the law of the recession of the galaxies. The further away you look, the faster things are going. He published this in 1929, and it's since been known, been called the Hubble Law. However, he was not in a complete vacuum, although he didn't know at the time he did this the theoretical motivations. That came out slightly later. So the first of these, um, <coughs> see, let me wake up my computer here, um, goes back some years before to a Russian um, mathematician um, who was one of the early people to understand Einstein's theory. And Einstein believed from the 1920s the universe was static. There was no reason to think of of expansion. It was just such an alien thing. Just as it's hard to believe the Earth is moving under our feet, it just seems so unnatural. However, Friedman realized that when Einstein dismissed the possibility of expansion, and he had to compensate with some very weird physics I'll come back to later, to balance gravity and stop it all collapsing, Friedman realized Einstein had made a mistake. He, he couldn't convince Einstein of this at first, um, and that there really was a possibility for an expanding universe. And so Friedman, in 1924, actually um, really developed the first model of expansion. But he was working in St. Petersburg. His work was not widely known in the West. And another scientist, a young man called Georges Lemaitre, who just finished his PhD at MIT, went out to Pasadena and talked to the scientists there, including Hubble, and 
he looked at the data that was available from them and from others, in particular from someone in Arizona called Beso Slifer, and the Matra, in 1927, produced this plot, essentially identical to Sandridge's plot two years later. Now, the Metra went on um, to become an ordained priest. Um, he uh, was the principal advisor to Pope Pius XII. In 1950, he wrote the encyclical that really established the notion that the Big Bang was a very legitimate theory um, and was perfectly consistent with the Catholic faith. But going back to 1927, Lemaitre made the mistake of publishing his work in French in the Comte Rendu of the Belgian Physical Society. And it was not widely known at all. And when eventually um, his work was discovered by Arthur Eddington, another great astronomer, English astronomer, and who had it translated, um, in the translation process, this diagram was left out. All mention of the data comparison was left out. And so, two years later, we don't think Hubble knew about this at all. Hubble produced this result. So, legitimately, um, this should be called, you know, the hubble lemaitre law of expansion. Anyway, the next phase that happened, of course, was that Einstein, who up till then could not accept the idea of expansion, was finally convinced by the data. And in this presumably posed photograph for the press um, we see Sandage um, just behind, uh, showing Einstein uh, a view through the Mount Wilson telescope um, that was led to his being convinced of this, uh, of the expanding universe that we now call the Big Bang Theory, um, beginning from some very high dense phase expanding, space expanding basically, and now galaxies moving along, developing with this and so on. So it's interesting, um, in hindsight, to realize that um, Hubble and Lemaitre, a lot of what they thought was data was really based on inspired guesswork. Um, if you go back to that diagram that we saw, um, you notice these points lie all over the place. So you can sort of draw a line through them and you develop an idea of expansion, but this is really a very tiny region they're looking at. Um, and so if, I, if we go to the modern data, here it is, um, there's a tiny region down there that Hubble and Lemaitre sampled, but it's only with beautiful modern data that this law of expansion keeps on going and going and going. Um, and now we're finally finding evidence that finally it does begin to deviate slightly. And deviation means in this case, Velocity increases with distance. If it deviates, you're accelerating very slightly. And this will come to later. That's a whole new development. But, but nevertheless, their, their conjecture, based on very crude data, has been beautifully confirmed. OK, so um, cosmology stayed there in the hands of the observational astronomers for many years who debated between them the reality of the expansion of space, whether measuring this recession really proved that space was expanding or not, whether you really had this very dense beginning. And there was no real proof of this um, until a whole other community of physics got involved in what they soon realized was the laboratory in space for doing physics. It's true that with the universe, you can't do experiments in the usual sense, but you can look back in time as you look fainter and fainter. And so you are testing basically what could have happened in a very, very dense phase of the universe. And so this new development occurred because in 1949, a whole other branch of physics, people doing nuclear physics, got fascinated by this new possibility of testing some of our ideas about nuclear reactions at very, very high densities. And the person who led this campaign was an emigre Russian physicist called George Gamow, along with a postdoc and a student of his, who realized that in the logical consequence of Hubble and the Maitre's expansion argument for the universe was a very, very dense phase, which most likely was also very, very hot. And what Gamow tru got Gamow truly excited was the fact that if it was hot, then at some point it would have been a natural place 
for thermonuclear reactions to occur, the very same reactions that power the sun. And you know the sun is powered by converting hydrogen into helium, basically. And so these very same reactions Gamow conjectured, conjectured could explain why helium is the second most abundant element in the universe. And not just helium, Gamow thought that maybe all of the elements were made in the first minutes of all the heavy elements, all of that chemistry came from the first minutes of the Big Bang. And this led to a prediction, which Gamow and his students never really followed through properly, but the idea was if the universe really went through this incredibly hot phase, there should today be a, a very weak relic of thermal radiation in the sky. It would have cooled down so much that we realized, and I'm not sure Gamow ever really did this calculation, but we know now it should be in the form of a microwave buzz in the sky. Um, as far as the elements go, well, Gamow was right, in part. Our calculations have now proven that helium and other light elements really did come from the minutes, first minutes of the Big Bang, but all the elements like carbon, the other stuff that we, most of the stuff that we're made of, in fact, comes from the ashes of exploding stars. And this was one of the reasons why astronomers um, had this big debate about whether the Big Bang or the steady state universe, what really happened at the beginning um, until one more element of proof came in that I'll show you in a second. And so the, the, the group that pushed the notion, the anti gamma view, that they said, helium, fine, you can have the Big Bang for that or whatever, we don't know where it comes from, but the stuff that we're made of comes from the ashes of stars, exploding stars. And um, in this curious way that physics is done, of the four people that proposed this idea, only one of them got the Nobel Prize. And, um, and this was partly for simple reasons, actually. Fred Hoyle um, did many, many other things, became notorious... Um, for really going off the mainstream. No one knows for sure. That probably didn't help him with his candidature. Margaret Burbage was an astronomer, a female astronomer, one of the first and greatest um, of the 20th century. But, you know, there was somewhat of a bias in the Nobel Foundation about giving the prize to astronomers. In fact, the story is that Nobel's wife, very young wife, he married at an advanced age, actually eloped, um, well once was an astronomer, once was a mathematician, and the story is that that's why we don't have Nobel Prizes in those two <laughs> subjects. Anyway, um, uh, and, and Burbage, likewise, her husband also went off in bizarre directions. So anyway, uh, Willie Fowler got the prize for essentially this discovery. So anyway, um, that's where um, um, things were, and um, the next part of the story um, comes about with um, the realisation that... Um, uh, first of all, this relic radiation uh, was finally seen as the cosmic microwave background, and that really put the clincher on this, that there was a very hot phase in the beginning, and that also was consistent with our explaining where the helium came from. And so the next part of the story concerns um, what is the universe made of? And again, one of, the, um, one of the real puzzles that we have, one of the biggest puzzles is that you know, most of the universe is simply not understandable in terms of any known substance. It, you know, it, it, we are, the stuff we're made of, the ordinary matter, is a tiny fraction, maybe 10 or 15% of the total matter content of the universe. It's made of some other particle, which is bizarre. And how do we know this? Well, um, this again um, comes about, there's a Carnegie connection here. And so um, uh, Carnegie astronomer Vera Rubin um, um, spent many years um, observing our, um, in California uh, on uh, Mount Palomar in the days when astronomers, when they observed distant galaxies, would pay to take photographic plates and so forth, develop them, um, and at the end of the night they, they would exhausted sleep and wake up the next day. At that time there were no facilities for female astronomers on the mountaintop. So Vera had to travel down at the end of every observing session, um, developing her plates, and then come up the next night. So it was really difficult in those days, in the 1950s. But she, she persevered, and she found that when you look at galaxies, um, there was e very strong evidence from the speeds at which the stars move around that something was holding them in orbit. There was dark stuff that you couldn't see that basically... 
kept the stars going in orbits around the central galaxy. Otherwise, they would fly off and leave the galaxy. And she worked that out by measuring the speeds of rotation. This is, this is the sort of data that she found, compiled from her modern observations. And the fact that the speeds of the stars don't decrease as you go further from the center of the galaxy tells you there is some dark stuff. I mean, what Kepler showed for the sun was that as the planets, you look at planets further and further away, their rotation speeds get slower and slower. Their orbits are longer and longer. That's simply not true for the galaxy. There's something out there giving an extra pull, and that is dark matter. And another astronomer um, who played a very big role in this story, um, but, you know, it, it was one of the most eccentric astronomers ever known, in fact, Fritz Vicky, um, also a Swiss connection here, um, uh, Swiss origin, and um, he had an office in the basement uh, of Caltech at Pasadena and was a very excellent observer and also had very strong theoretical views about many things and about his colleagues. Um, <laughs> and um, it's said that he's expressing his opinion of one of his colleagues here. Um, uh, <laughs> right, and there is another interpretation to which I won't go into, but um, anyway, so what he realized that a galaxy cluster like this, this is a few million light years across, again, the galaxies will be flying apart were it not for vast amounts of dark matter. And so he conjectured this in 1933 based on measured velocities. And only in the last decade have we verified this um, without any shred of doubt from Einstein's theory that basically um, matter bends light, space bends light, gravity bends light, and it turns out that the presence of the dark matter curves the light, produces distortion in all of the images of the galaxies, and here's a map of the dark matter in this cluster of galaxies. So th this is the strongest evidence that we have that there really is vast amounts of dark matter. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's just go back briefly to the reason why the debate that went on in the 1950s when the word Big Bang was introduced by Fred Hoyle uh, to mock, really, the idea of creation, of uh, a dense beginning, as being absurd, why that has now become the accepted dogma among cosmologists. What happened to change this? Um, well, again, it was an experimental discovery. So here you have two radio astronomers um, who were surveying the sky, mapping the Milky Way, in the 19, 1964 and found with a telescope that Bell Labs gave them that was unused, uh, that was already obsolete, but very good for astronomy, um, there was this unexplained, very tiny background, uh, this buzz in microwaves. And it's not such a dim microwave background. If you actually turn your TV on in between channels, 1% of that white noise that you see on the screen is the cosmic microwave background. So it's, by modern standards, it's trivial to find. In 1964, it wasn't so obvious. They discovered it when they pointed their telescope, saw exactly the same buzz. So this was the glow from the Big Bang. And the clincher in the argument was when, with data taken over the next two or three decades, finally with the, the Kobe satellite, they proved this radiation had this perfect black body spectrum. And the black body is radiation that comes from a perfect furnace. Okay? And the, now, what is astonishing, I think, to everyone who looks, every physicist who looks at this picture, is to realize that these bars, what we call error bars, this is the wavelength of the light, this is what a black body looks like, which comes from an ideal furnace, these error bars are each of them 400 standard deviations. So the most precise black body that we've ever measured anywhere is probably out there in, the spa in space, it's coming from the distant universe, measured by a satellite, um, finally. So things really have changed in, in astronomy over the years. So when I got my first job at Berkeley, um, there was a certain amount of confusion. And this is one example. This was a letter to me from our <laughs> vice president okay, of the university, um, who somehow got things slightly confused. <laughs> I, I can report that this building finally was demolished last year, and that we, we are, because of earthquakes, Problems that we're hoping there'll be, they're hoping there'll be a new one at some point. So. Okay, finally. So what then was, um, uh, what was the next step in the story? Okay, well, the next step in the story um, was that, um, fine, so we've discovered the glow from the universe, but the other thing that got cosmologists very worried was the fact that, you know, we're in this very structured, complex universe. Why on earth should there be this uniform glow in the sky? Surely... 
um, if our galaxy is formed, we think, by gravity, there must be some seeds, you know, that small fluctuations, slight denser regions from which they eventually, you know, grew. Um, and we'll see in a moment that theory predicts this, but observationally, where were they? And so this was the key. And so the observational story, again, it's, a, in, it's fascinating because it began soon after the discovery in 1964, Penzias and Wilson reported the background was smooth to 10% or something. And then over the years, people tried harder and harder to search for tiny differences in the temperature from one point to another. So this radiation is 2.73 degrees, of absolute zero. Very, very cold. But you measure it as microwaves. And it was smooth to a few parts in 100,000. Nevertheless, there is time enough in the universe for fluctuations to grow. So there had to be, at some level, something. And I would think it's fair to say that the skeptics of the Big Bang remained out there, unconvinced, until finally um, they found something. And this happened in 1990. The reason it was so difficult is when we look at the early universe, we're looking through this, it's like driving along the freeway in a car with a filthy windshield, right? We have all these foregrounds coming in, some from, from galaxies, others from dust in the galaxy, all sorts of things, and even noise neural detectors, it, it's, it's a real mess. But finally, um, by going, launching satellites, um, uh, things have really improved. And so this came about in 1992, where they finally found what has been called the seeds of creation. So how did this work? Well, um, it, was a, you know, it was a major discovery at the time, um, you can see it made headlines, uh, front page in the Washington Post. Um, and um, just to show you how hard it is, here is a map of something that you know. And um, if you now view this map of the Earth through the resolution of this telescope, the, the first cosmic uh, microwave background observer, the first one, the COBE telescope, launched in 1990, um, this is what you'd see. And so you have to stare at this for a long time to deduce this map over here, which is basically the Milky Way, which has been carved out, basically. So this is two. But all this other stuff around it are the one point in 100,000 fluctuations when all, the, all this other noise has been removed. So th these are the seeds of the Big Bang. And this was a great discovery in 1992. And it's interesting to see that the world reacted in, in the UK I, I don't know why this is, but it was even greater news. You can see major banner headlines um, about the Big Bang. Um, uh, and in France, it uh, even, I think, made it to page three of Le Monde or something, La Grumeau de la <laughs> Suisse. Come on. And, uh, okay. And, and then finally, a few years later, um, when it was confirmed, I should say, so this is a new satellite, um, which was um, launched uh, about 12 years ago. And, th and th this will concern my microwave anisotropy probe, it's called, um, they measured the fluctuations at a much higher resolution. It's hard to see in this light, but they can reproduce all of these, and you can see individual structure in them. And the two um, principals of this experiment received the Nobel Prize for that, George Smoot and John Mather. Okay, so that, okay, so that's where cosmology got to. But this, this is observational, right? So what about the theoretical understanding well, again, this is something that the astronomers did not get very far with. And it's an interesting story in physics that it takes a whole new community, as happened with the nuclear physicists in the 1940s, and in the 1980s, it was the turn of the particle physicists. So these are people that basically smash atoms together. Their big experiment now is, is in CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, they're busy discovering you know, the case for the Higgs boson, et cetera, now as you speak. But way back in this time, in the 1980s, you know, they were very frustrated. Um, there was no big experiment running. The superconducting super collider was being cancelled, et cetera. The, of the billions were spent digging holes in the ground. All that sort of thing that ha was happening in that period. But so they, they, they suddenly turned to the, to, to the view that, well, maybe out there in the universe, which is very, very dense, very, very hot, this is the ideal place to test our theories of particle physics. And that, indeed, is what they set out to do. And this is roughly how it goes. So this is the story of physics as you change energy. Okay? So we're at very low energy, very boring 
in, by particle physics standards, but it's important for life. We couldn't exist if the universe was too hot, of course, today. So here we are. This is at the beginning where the Big Bang predicts we should be starting from. Tiny, tiny fractions of a second after time zero, the beginning of the Big Bang itself. Let's assume that's all right. That's all correct. This is the theory. Um, we haven't really got a theory of the very beginning. Because there's a big question mark there because this is where quantum mechanics, quantum theory and gravity meet, and we're still waiting for the right theory which combines the two. But once you get away from this slightly mysterious period which we conjecture about, then it's all pretty much classical physics, Einstein's theory, standard particle physics, and that theory has the following intriguing prediction. As the energies go down, the interactions between the particles change slightly. And at low energy, the forces that control us being here, like chemistry, can work fine. But at too high an energy, you know, the, all those bonds are broken. And you have to, you know, there are much other forces that come in. And so we divide the forces of nature into the electromagnetic and weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force. And then finally, gravity. So we give up on gravity, but we find, that, but experimentally, we find these nuclear forces and all converge together. Theory says they must converge, but we can't test this in any part of the accelerator known because at the Large Hadron Collider goes over here. Okay, that's what we can test. Okay, we have to go many, many factors of ten higher to test the ultimate unification of the forces of nature. To do this, we'd have to build an accelerator from the Earth to the Moon or beyond, which would be a budget so enormous that no one has even suggested it. Okay, seriously. Okay, but the Big Bang is out there, and it happened. It happened once. Okay, so we can do something. We can look for evidence. And here is the prediction that came from this evidence. It's a bit like the simplest analogy is, is of a, a lake um, uh, uh, cooling down. Um, and um, ice forming, and there's extra energy to do with the latent heat of ice, okay? Um, and, um, and, you know, fish can survive under, under ice. They don't freeze, etc. And so in some sense, when these extra, and that's called a phase transition, as you go from freezing from, from water to ice or from, you know, vice versa. And so in some sense, if the universe um, basically is cooling down, there also is a phase transition between these forces and that is thought to be capable of releasing a whole lot of energy. And it was worked out that at this incredibly high energy, there should be the unification of the forces, schematically shown here, and that should lead us then to predict a huge release of energy. And this release of energy leads to an amazing um, prediction that the universe should be expanding dramatically for a very brief period, enormously. And so we can start off from a very small universe and reach a very big one. And so the two people who pioneered this theory came from particle physics, um, are shown here, and, um, and you can tell it's very hard to uh, get the, convince people that these ideas um, really uh, are more than just hand-waving, okay? Um, trying to describe the size of the Big Bang. Um, the Big Bang, believe me, was very, very, very big, etc. Nevertheless, we think that there are experiments you can do that do take us very much on this path of this theory of inflation, which takes us from a very small universe to the enormous one we, we see. Um, and that was their idea. Okay? And so here, for example, is another cartoon, which is drawn to scale okay, and shows you, as it was, the universe, you know, it's not spherical at all, and then suddenly this incredible inflation occurred. And what does that inflation do? Well, here is one of the examples of what inflation can do for you. You can start off with something very, very irregular, and then you expand it immensely, and it becomes extremely flat, like blowing up a balloon. And if we live in some sort, this is meant to symbolize our three-dimensional space. It's crude, but you can imagine we can start off with something very irregular, end up with something that's locally very, very flat, uniform in three dimensions, and yet could be enormous as well. So this is the sort of idea that motivated Guth and Lindy to develop their theory. They could explain how big the universe was. And, um, and uh, th now this also led to another intriguing consequence that in this, in this beginning of the universe, there were lots of irregularities, and they, they showed that there had to be some left over, even at this stage, okay, as a consequence of the inflation theory. 
Uh, and that was quite an amazing prediction too. Okay, so they could solve all sorts of problems with this theory. And here's another, here's the consequence for the Big Bang. So before 1980, the 1980s, this is what we thought of as the universe. There was some enormous universe, and this is the region that we can see with our very biggest telescopes. And making the telescopes twice as big will not make a huge difference, but you know, some 15 billion years back into the past, so how far we can see. But if the universe went through this incredible early expansion, and then slowed down and did what it normally does, space that expands, I should say, this now is what we have as our view of the universe. Okay, so here we are, this is our, our causal patch, our horizon, all we can see at present with our biggest telescopes, but there's some enormous universe out here, which could be infinite even, with lots of galaxies, maybe just like our own, that we cannot possibly see, um, maybe if we wait long enough, we'll see them one day, because this is as far as light has traveled in 15 billion years, roughly the age of the Big Bang. So there's no way, but we conjecture, if this inflation theory occurred, there should be some enormous universe. So it's an incredible challenge to see if there's any way we can test this. And so we ask, what is it that the inflation theory predicts? So there is one very nice prediction that it makes. It's to do with these tiny fluctuations, these ripple it, ripples in space-time density, really, that lead to the seeds from which the galaxies were made. So the theory does not just the size, but also the seeds. And so we've been trying very hard to test this theory of seeds. So first of all, there's a numerical simulation of structure forming from tiny seeds, and um, eventually galaxies form. Okay, the idea is things began begin almost smoothly and structure develops over time just by gravity pulling things in. It's a bit like capitalism, the rich get richer and the weak, the empty parts get emptier, etc. cetera, in, in this picture, um, just because of gravity. And, um, and you're trying to make galaxies like this. And, th and the way this, this picture goes is that according to the theory of inflation, you start off with some uniform number, which are the ripples in space-time predicted by inflation. You can think of them as wrinkles on a dried apple. That's been one that I've just given, okay. And then you let things go. So it turns out that these wrinkles, then because of gravity, get larger and larger, then, and eventually um, these clouds collapse and make galaxies. And it so happens that there's a very simple prediction of the theory, which says that as I go to um, the early universe, when these wrinkles first began collapsing, that early universe was so hot that their growth was very limited. And so not much happened. They all they only grew much later, okay? And so you have this thing frozen in the early universe, and then after the universe got to a certain point and cooled down enough, then the growth really got going, okay? And then the smaller, the first ones grow the most, and the ones that are just coming inside, you know, the region that we can see, they started growing. So you have this picture of a predicting a distribution of density patches in the universe, and this is what gives rise to the fluctuations of the radiation. This is a prediction. This green line is what the theory predicts. Okay, so what do we actually see? Well, it turns out that when you translate this prediction into um, the actual radiation field that we see, it looks a little bit different. Um, it has these funny wiggles in, and the wiggles are just because these fluctuations are oscillating around. So just take my word for it, the, the wiggles are nothing serious, but the main point you should get from this is the theory of inflation predicts this black line, okay? And the observations that we have from different experiments are all these points over here. And so this is from a satellite experiment, the Wilkinson microwave probe, the one I showed you with the Nobel Prize picture. This is from a, a more recent experiment which has very high resolution so this is high angular scale. Um, this is large angular scale. Um, placed at the South Pole, okay, where the sky is very clear, little water vapor, ideal place for doing um, infrared astronomy, for infrared astronomy. And so this is the picture from this satellite, and these are these very tiny fluctuations. If you analyze the fluctuations, then they, that gives you this distribution along with the new experiment with all these Luera bars, and here is the inflation prediction. And um, the reason things don't quite fit at this end is that here is where the small fluctuations have grown the most, and there are some simple corrections, and then when you correct, you go through the point. So the thing is, you have this amazing comparison of a theoretical prediction with observational data. There are many, many points on this plot. They fit beautifully um, in detail. 
And so we're pretty convinced now that we have an understanding of, um, of a, predict a confirmation that inflation really did occur, something very close to it anyway. At least this prediction is out there being verified. And here's another incredible consequence. So when you look at this radiation, you're looking back to when the universe was like opaque. It's like looking into a fog. The radiation comes to us from very far away, from the early fireball. It, it was opaque. So we're seeing these microwave photons. It was very transparent to microwaves, the nearby universe. We look back into the past, and here then is this, is this fog from which we can't directly see the Big Bang. Okay, now, from these fluctuations, we can actually measure something quite amazing. We can measure the effects of space being curved. Now, geometry, we're all taught at school, is Euclidean. Okay, Euclid's triangle, 180 degrees in the triangle. That is not true according to Einstein's theory. If there's matter, uh, gravity curves space. And the universe has certainly got mattering, space should be curved. So you could tell the difference from the microwave background between a curved and a, and a space in which the light travels in straight lines. This is, this is because of gravity affecting curving the light. Um, and so you can tell the difference, and you can learn about the curvature of space. Okay, so this gets us into uh, a really interesting question, um, namely, um, Einstein said gravity curves space, and this is the prediction that we have in the different possible possibilities for the Big Bang Theory. I should say, first of all, that if inflation occurred, space expands so much that locally it should be flat. It should be really Euclid very close to being Euclidean. However, that isn't necessarily the case. If inflation didn't occur, then, you know, you could have space um, basically having this sort of curvature, appropriate to the surface of a sphere, or it would, with which the triangles of a triangle add up to less than 180, or they could be larger, in which you have a hyperbolic space like a saddle. A sphere is finite, a saddle is geometrically infinite. So we can talk about infinite spaces, finite spaces, um, or the plain case, which is infinite. Okay, so all these are possibilities from Einstein's theory. Now, let me give you a slight diversion here. I don't know how many of you know the paintings of M.C. Escher, but he was able to remarkably put all of these notions of space curvature into, into, his, into his drawings. And so this is just truly remarkable. This is um, his, one of his angels and demons uh, um, uh, etchings. And you can see that as you move uh, further away, the size is increasing. That's one of the cases of space being curved. Um, okay, um, and in fact, um, uh, this, is, this is what you ha expect in the case of the spherical geometry because um, as, as you go around the, the surface of the sphere, images seem to grow. He also, um, and this is where it gets really interesting, was able to depict with angels and demons the case of the hyperbolic geometry, amazingly, in which you can see things get smaller and smaller. And it's fair to say that, you know, this is a conformal map of geometry. And for those of you who are into mathematics at all, this is conformal infinity out here, okay? This is an accurate realization of conformal infinity. So this is an infinite universe, okay, a conformal transformation in, into a picture. Okay, so um, anyway, um, we believe the universe is very close to being flat, but it's interesting that you can go to Escher's amazing paintings and and think, think about curvature in, you know, being represented in, in the world of art, actually, also. I don't think Escher ever really uh, got into the details of this, but he, he was a very intuitive artist, obviously. Okay, so this leads us in to another consequence of the effects of curvature, okay? I said that space is curved. Well, a big surprise has come up in the past decade, okay? So what, what's this surprise? Well, this is the only equation I'm going to show you tonight. So here we have Einstein scribbling on the board. And what he basically said was that the curvature of space, which is due to gravity, and gravity you can describe as due to mass, basically, and more formally, energy and momentum. Okay? And so he wrote down equations in which you have you know, curvature, space being curved, and some source, which is the mass in the universe. However, Einstein at the time he did this, had a real problem, because for him, the universe was static. And a static universe would have collapsed, which would be a very bad thing. So he said, let me put in something mysterious, which is called lambda. Okay, and this lambda term would compensate gravity. It was repulsion, anti-gravity, from a mathematical construct. 
And so that went into the equation in 1916 um, and promptly went away uh, in 1930 when Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe and convinced Einstein that we're an expanding universe. Okay. However, it's come back to haunt us because uh, one of my clever colleagues some years ago realized by the following mathematical trick that if you put this term on the other side of the equations, you can have something which we now call dark energy, something you can't see, um, and um, if so, it's anti-gravity, it would lead to a slight acceleration. And the hunt has been on for deviations from Hubble's law for this mysterious thing. And lo and behold, in the year 2000, astronomers detected dark energy. So I showed you the, the Hubble curve, the slight evidence for acceleration, but let me um, to just tell you how they did this. So what they look at in very different galaxies are these exploding stars called supernovae. And a supernova is thought to be um, a pretty uniform object. Um, that is to say, we think we know intrinsically how bright it is because it's a certain amount of nickel that decays, etc., from the theory calibrated on many nearby supernovae, exploding stars. So when we see one far away around this distant galaxy, we think we know how bright it is. Now it turned out that when you look far away, this was simply too faint. By 25%, a significant amount. Um, and so they eventually thought of every possible thing, you know, could it be dust in the way or something, or something weird about light traveling. Eventually they gave up on all of this and said, no, the universe must be accelerating, hence that's why these seem to be fainter. They're just further away than they think we are because of acceleration. Um, and these are the uh, three gentlemen that um, got the Nobel Prize last year, one of whom is a local at Johns Hopkins, Saul uh, Adam Rees, Saul Perlmutter from Berkeley, and um, Brian Schmidt from um, the Australian National University. Okay, so um, the universe does have lots of dark energy in, and so where does this get us? Okay, so they did this um, following budget. Okay, they realized that you can measure now um, I mentioned dark matter. We have lots of dark matter. Lots of, so now we have another problem. We have, dark, we have two, two dark things in the universe. It's really very worrying. But you, we think we understand both. Because when we look at structures, I showed you examples of galaxies and clusters, we measure dark matter. No problem. We measure the supernova, we measure anti-gravity, acceleration, we measure the difference. And finally, when we measure the curvature of the universe from the microwave background, we measure everything, dark matter plus dark energy. So those of you um, who remember your high school algebra will see we have three equations for two things, and we can surely solve that, and we think we have solved that, and we are convinced now that we have this following uh, very bizarre picture of the universe. Okay? So here is this plot of dark matter versus dark energy, um, and um, this is the dividing line between a finite and an infinite universe, and this is where the data from these three arguments all projects us, and... Um, <coughs> That's where it is, and you can see we're right on the borderline between the universe being infinite or, or finite. We don't quite know. It's fascinating. What is certainly true is the universe is very, very large. That's for sure, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the truth will come if we succeed in spending many, many hundreds of billions of dollars in the not distant future on new telescopes, and that's a very controversial item at the moment. The Europeans are planning to do this, but the U.S. is having second thoughts at the moment. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but so where we are with, um, with this then is the following. This is the sum of everything. So here is, here is all the dark energy. This is where it, a lot of it is out there. Here is the dark matter, and here are the atoms of stuff that we're made of. So we're a tiny fraction of everything. Okay, <clears throat> so that's where we are today, um, and we do not know what the dark matter is. Many experiments are looking for it. We do not know what the dark energy is. That's more of a theoretical issue. I'll explain that in a second. Um, it's a very worrying issue, but we think we've measured it, that it's there. Um, that's the only explanation for the acceleration. Um, what could it be? Well, the question of what could it be has led to what has been called the greatest problem in physics today. Okay, and let me explain what that great problem is and tell you how the theorists have come to an explana a quite explanation of this. Okay, so... Um, this is roughly what we measure for the dark energy. We call it vacuum because it's thought to be basically there's nothing out there. So it's the zero point energy of fluctuation. So this is the no a number. Never mind what the units are. But here is the prediction from the particle physicists who invented inflation, basically, and their successors. Okay? 
who really have done a lot for cosmology, but they suddenly ran into a brick wall because this is what they predict. This is 10 to the power of 112, and this is 10 to the minus 10. So they're off by 120 factors of 10, okay? <laughs> this has been called the worst prediction in physics, okay? So, <laughs> right, so what do you do about this? Okay, well, it's led to um, a, an amazing consequence, okay? So the idea is that, right, maybe the inflation theory does tell us there could have been lots of other universes, nothing special about our universe. Um, and so here we are, um, one of the versions of inflation theory, which predicts all these parallel universes. Each bubble here is a parallel universe. Um, one of these is us, here we are. This is our universe, our particular patch. There are all these others out here. Now, it so happens that there are enough of these other universes that all of those have very uh, large values of the dark energy. And if there are enough of them, then on the average, there'd be one with just the right value, okay, which is our one. Okay, and so this is the motivation. There's a huge number of possibilities. And so, but this still doesn't quite get us there, okay. Um, and so this has led to um, uh, one more uh, variation on this argument, that there's just this one universe out of all these which is consistent with our kind of life. If the universe was too hot or too cold, we wouldn't be here. The stars would be made, etc. We'd all be full of black holes, etc. You know, there's got to be a very tiny region of, of, in the numbers of possible fundamental constants, you know, that we could be living in. Okay, um, and so it's been argued that the explanation for this, <coughs> since inflation doesn't just tell you it's possible, but doesn't really say why, might be that you know, here we have life. Okay possible. All these other, there are enough of these others so they can accommodate all the possible values of dark energy. Okay, um, so the problem with this is called the multiverse theory, okay? All these multiverses, now you may w wonder, you know, how on earth can we test the multiverse? The answer is we can't, of course. Um, I showed you the picture of our horizon in this very, very big universe. Already we know there are many, many galaxies that we can never see. And it may get worse in the future, I'll explain why in a second. But, you know, the multiverse theory goes on and says, well, there are many, many universes we can never see. People have called this the slippery slope, okay? You know, it's not so different to go from one to the other. But it's been criticized. And so um, the main criticism is that this multiverse theory can't make any predictions at all. It can explain anything. In which case, you have to wonder whether it's really physics. So I'll give you two counter-arguments, um, which have not been fully studied yet, but are possible things. Th so this is the physics the closest we have to a physics solution, I would say. So um, theory, string theory, predicts an enormous number of possible universes. And so this is the number they called Calabi Yale manifolds. And if you arrange all of these in some space I don't even want to get into, it turns out that in the lowest part of this space, there are just three of them. Okay, so if you argue that if I have, this is some sort of topological variant, if I believe that these three correspond to the three independent flavors of a standard model of physics, maybe that's what comes out of this, then at least I can get from some vast number down to three where physics as we know it could operate. So that's one type of theory that's very far from explaining things, but it's a flavor of what we have to get someday from a better theory, so-called string theory, quantum theory plus gravity. Here's another theory, which um, I don't like either, because uh, this is the anti-Copernican theory. It says that, you know, this is, this is the universe, you know, this is where we are in the normal universe. But here, in this case, maybe we're living in the center of a very big hole, okay? A huge hole, roughly the size of an observable universe, almost that size. And because it's a big hole, it's expanding a little more rapidly. Gravity's a little bit less, and so you're, you're mimicking acceleration. That's a pretty nasty theory, too. We're right in the middle of this big hole, and I don't think that's any better either. But astronomers haven't completely ruled that out either. Okay, so um, here is um, a great quote about cosmology, often in error but never in doubt, from Landau. And I, I would say that, um, you know, to summarize here, you know, maybe what we need is a fundamental physics theory of dark energy, or we have to go, hopefully, there'd be some explanation. Um, and what, you know, what all of this needs is, is, is the following, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think Carl Sagan was the person who first propagated this in, in his quest for, um, you know, extraterrestrial life, planets, etc. Okay, so to, let me just summarize then um, a couple more things. Um, 
the future in experiment is very exciting. Um, we're, it's also very expensive, unfortunately. Um, what we know is that the dark matter around us is not ordinary matter, it's something more exotic. We think it's some sort of weakly interacting particle that, does, that goes freely through our bodies, freely through stars. But nevertheless, it will occasionally interact and there could be signals. So we're busy building detectors deep underground. This is in a deep uh, um, mine, deep underground. Um, and um, the idea there is you're shielded from the cosmic rays. These dark matter particles occasionally pass through. They pass through us. They go to the detector because there's no noise from cosmic rays. Maybe you'll see some, some weird thing. Um, also, these cosmic rays, um, when they hit the dark matter particles, when they, when they go into the sun, the sun traps them too. It's a great laboratory for trapping particles. We think in many cases these particles, dark matter, weird particles might actually hit each other, produce bursts, tiny flashes of energy. And so we're looking for those from gamma rays. This is a telescope in Namibia, which has recently been greatly expanded to look for dark matter. Um, this is another one at the South Pole, where we're actually drilling deep into the ice um, and looking for flashes of light from the products of these dark matter particles in the sun, hitting the Earth, creating tiny light flashes and being visible um, in this otherwise very dark environment, deep under rice or deep under water. And finally, satellites looking for gamma rays like this, uh, like this experiment is too. So that's sort of the future. Um, and, um, you know, vast funds are going into the ex all these experiments. So far, nothing to report, apart from intriguing hints. But as far as dark energy goes, um, that's taking us into an entirely other regime. Here we need bigger and better telescopes. And um, one of the, um, um, I apologize for not having the Carnegie telescope on this. <laughs> okay, but this is its main rival <laughs> um, from uh, Caltech. And so the idea is to build bigger and bigger telescopes. This is um, a projected 30 meter telescope, a projected 40 meter telescope in Europe. Um, this is a current Planck satellite taking data. I'm um, about to release it, hopefully, for cosmology. There's a new survey just getting going in, in Chile called the Dark Energy Survey. And finally, a new satellite projected to be launched by Europe in a few years, de designed specifically to search for deviations, signals of dark energy in the universe. Okay, um, so that's the future. And as far as the future of theory goes, to ex understand things like this is our nearest galaxy seen, it's seen from space, um, we need either a new Einstein, um, hopefully that'll come about someday, but in the meantime, much better observations, um, but theory as well of numerical simulations and observations with much more detail than we've had today. So the problem with all of this, of course, is that um, <coughs> um, the only thing that we lack here is the budget. Uh, <laughs> right, and so, okay, so let me just tell you one more prediction for the future, going back to the title of my talk, really, what, what awaits us. Well, what is truly amazing is the following, that here we are, this is what we can see, 15 billion light years, but let's take this acceleration that we're seeing, you know, let's take its claim at face value, we are accelerating, that has this amazing prediction for the future. In 140 billion years' time, this is all we'll see in the night sky. Everything else will have moved away from us. And so as far as, now we see a sky full of stars with tons of lots of galaxies, many billions of galaxies, but in this time, there'll be just, just us. It'll be a very lonely place. Um, okay, so, thank you. <laughs> well, we've had a fantastic tour of the universe. And we'll even forgive him for not showing the Carnegie Telescope. <laughs> uh, there are two microphones, and we'll invite uh, those who have uh, a question to come to the microphone. We have time for a few. Please. Um, at the beginning of your talk, uh, for which, thank you, uh, you had a sentence that ran something like this. Uh, and that's why there's no Nobel for, and, I, and then everyone laughed, and I couldn't hear whether it was math or astronomy. Astronomy. Right, okay, yes, so that was just a, a story which I'm not sure how accurate this is, but it said that Nobel, well, Nobel certainly did not have prizes in astronomy or in mathematics, and it was thought to be due to some personal issues with uh, his young wife. <laughs> Please. So, in one of 
your slides, it looked like you, were, you said you were on the border of either being an infinite or a finite universe. So does that mean that we don't know whether we're finite or infinite, or does the um, evidence so far lean toward one or the other? I, I would say the evidence so far is it, we're right on the edge there. We, we, it could go, what we're sure, it's very close to being on the line. Space is pretty flat, Euclidean. And exactly which way it goes, uh, we can't tell. So, uh, but because we're so close to that line, it's sure it's got to be extremely large. So it, even if it's finite, it's got to be very, very big. That's for sure. The other microphone. Thank you. I noticed in one of your last slides um, that uh, it said that um, dark matter is not ordinary matter. How do you know that? Okay, well, there's so much of it that um, if uh, it was interacting like protons do or any normal particles, there'd be uh, consequences. One of them would be the dark matter would, collect, would collect in the inner parts of galaxies and the galaxies would look nothing like they do. The fact that the dark matter is not where most of the stars are but in the outer parts tells us that it's weakly interacting with ordinary matter and with itself for that matter too. Please. Is it possible that the Higgs boson will in any way offer any explanation for the constituents of dark matter or dark energy? Um, it's in question. Um, people are certainly um, trying to construct models, and so far th th they've realized that um, uh, if the Higgs boson really is confirmed, that forces you to models in which the dark matter particle is quite massive compared to what people have previously thought. So it's definitely constraining very much our ideas of what it might be. But there's a certain amount of theoretical con conjecture involved. And until we actually find some real indications of it out there with the gamma ray experiments or whatever, it's a little early to go too far. In one of your slides, you show a large uh, array of galaxies. And you have a circle that says, that's as far as we can see. If all those galaxies started off at one point with a big bang, and we can only see that far, did they travel faster than the speed of light to get there? No, no. It, it's space, in some sense, that expands at faster than the speed of light. But the galaxies themselves don't. So space is pulling them apart. <coughs> okay. So there's no problem with space moving. <laughs> Please. <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a theory that states that the universe has a total energy of zero. So is there a way that can we, we can measure the curvatures in space in order to determine or provide evidence for that theory? Well, that, that's exactly why we're not sure. It's so close to zero that we can't tell whether it's plus epsilon or minus epsilon. Right? It could be on either side. And if it's slightly more than zero, space is infinite. But if it's slightly less than zero, it's finite. So that's exactly the the borderline that we're trying to test by measuring dark matter and dark energy, too. Yes, it was Charlier that Nobel despised, and that is why he would not give the prize to an astronomer. We got in the back door to Beta later in 1938 or so. But my two questions are some modern results. The one by Gupta, using the Shander X-ray telescope, finds that our galaxy is completely surrounded by a hot gas. And the other, the implications of that, and the other is Stirk, finding that nuclear reactions are changed when the sun vibrates a bit, which is a mystery sort of phenomena, but relevant. Right, so the, um, the idea the nuclear reactions are changing is based on very flimsy evidence, and only, I think, Sterak and one of his colleagues actually believe those. No one else, they've not managed to convince any other people. Um, your other question was about... The sorry? hot gas around the oh, galaxy. Hot gas, that's right, yeah. So we do discover, with X-ray astronomy, hot gas around galaxies, but it's a small part of the total amount, so it doesn't contribute much to the overall budget of things. Most of the mass seems to be in stars, um, in the galaxies themselves. Okay, the people at the microphone will be the last questions, please. Second question, if it's true that 
Euclidean geometry does not apply in space and that therefore the furthest stars we see are not, so to speak, in a straight line, but instead have been bent by the force of gravity. Is it possible in some odd way that when we peer deeply into space, we're actually looking back at ourselves? Right, so um, that actually raises the very interesting question, namely, um, we don't really know the topology of the universe, okay? Um, so um, it's not predicted by Einstein's theory. So, you know, for example, a, um, a sphere has a very simple topology, but a coffee mug does not. It's got a handle, okay? And so that's one example of how you can imagine light going around the handle and coming back on itself. If that were description of space. So the answer is we don't know. Um, uh, space could be co have a complex topology. Um, we've set limits on the absence of repetitions of galaxies in space. Those limits say that if we were looking back at ourselves, we'd have to look very far indeed. And as you look further and further, things get fainter and fainter and more fuzzy, so it's very hard to test. So, but in principle, we, we, can, we can't quite rule that out, but it's very unlikely. But there's no firm prediction to test anyway. Okay. Final two questions. Okay. Um, so I was wondering, since, well, as soon as they figure out whether the uh, universe is finite or not, is there a way to, like, physically test that out? I don't know if that's too out of reach, far to reach or, like, sending out something. Okay, so, you know, it's, the, the best hope we have is geometry, measuring the geometry of the universe. And, um, you know, by arguments, equivalent to measuring the angles in a triangle, but applied to you know, very distant um, galaxies, trying to measure how space may or may not be curved very far away compared to locally. And um, it's, it's a very tough problem. And the, the difference is so small that it's hard to, you know, at the moment to think of any cl clean ways to, to see any difference, any significant difference, actually. Uh, in the future, do you believe that uh, as our technology uh, expands and do you believe that we will be able to see to the possible end of the universe? Or how much farther into the universe do you think we'll be able to see based on technology and telescopes? Okay, so the, the sort of technology that we're developing now, especially with these enormous telescopes, is remarkable. We'll be able to directly measure the expansion of the universe by looking at a pair of objects and seeing them move apart significantly, okay, um, in terms of their relative motions. And so, yeah, we're, we're th that'll come about in the next 10, 10 or 20 years. Um, and so that, that probably is the major breakthrough, to directly test the expansion that way. Thank you. Okay, we'll allow one more question. He's been patient at the microphone. Hi, um, this is kind of an off-topic question, but uh, how do you feel about the Mayans' prediction of the world ending in 2012? <laughs> 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 I, I figured if anyone He knew. wanted to know about the you Mayan know. prediction for the end of the universe. Oh, right, right. No, I, I, I don't take it seriously. <laughs> Are you for sure about that? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> well, we've had a fascinating evening. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Silk, and we hope you'll all join us for our next Carnegie Capital Science Lecture. Thank you.